Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Good afternoon and welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint Podcast. Uh, <clears throat> we're coming at you on July 24th and the heart of still some occasional riots going on around the country and uh, COVID shutdowns in full swing. And we're going to get into some of those topics and more uh, in the coming half hour. But first, I want to introduce our panelists to you. Up in our left-hand corner, we have Tim Everett, our screaming eagle of freedom, and he's a pilot in the state of California. And in our right-hand corner, we have Leon the Word Brathwhite, our last word in liberty. <clears throat> and he's a retired engineer in the state of California. And my name is Jason McPhee, and I'll be your host today. Um, I also want to let you know that uh, uh, you can send comments in uh, during the show. There should be a uh, uh, occasional scroll going across the screen on our um, uh, email address. And uh, uh, you can send any comments you might have. And if we have time, we will uh, address those in a bonus section at the end of the show. Um, <clears throat> and if you also have any experiences with uh, you know, your business or job being uh, disrupted by riots or uh, COVID shutdowns. We'd love to hear about that as well. And, uh, we, you know, if there's enough there, we'll even try and get you on the show as well to talk about it. Uh, so send those in if you can. Uh, but <clears throat> now let's jump right into the heat of the matter. Uh, uh, so the Supreme Court's been active over the last month or so. And a few decisions that came out about a week or two ago were... Uh, you know, uh, they're always interesting uh, when the Supreme Court speaks. And in this case, uh, they gave a decision about religious schools and funding of religious schools. And it has to do with uh, um, <coughs> the uh, scholarships, I guess. And so essentially, if a, uh, if a, program, if a state offers scholarships uh, to schools, to private schools, I, I think the... Uh, uh, the ruling was that they cannot exclude religious schools uh, right. in that yeah. offering. And so yeah. this particular uh, issue was because I, I think the woman who uh, wanted to send her girls to a uh, Catholic religious school, and and it's actually a privately funded, I believe, uh, uh, scholarship in this particular case. However, yeah. there is a tax benefit to the people who uh, make that donation and that's where I think the hook is where uh, some of the people are trying to protest the, the separation from church and state here and so uh, the ruling was that you know once that uh, has been made available that you have uh, scholarship programs in the state that you cannot at that point uh, discriminate against uh, you know, you know if, it, if it winds up being a religious school that's going to get that money so uh, I don't know if either of you guys want to talk at all about that well, I, I mean, I would, I would prefer that the government was not involved in education at all, okay? But, however, since they are, it is as it is. And I would like them to get out of education as much as possible. And I think this ruling may help that along. It, it is not as far reaching as I would have liked it, but it will help it along. Because I think in order for us to get to improve the public schools, especially the disgraceful conditions that we see of the public schools in the inner cities of America. In order to improve those things, we'll have to start giving vouchers into the hands of parents and let them decide where they want to send their children to school. If they want to send them to a public school, it's fine. If they want to send them to a religious school, that should be fine too. If they want to send them to some other private school, that should be okay, a non-secular private school, that should be okay. What we need is competition. That's what we need. And I hope this ruling will push us in that direction. We wouldn't get there yet. It will be a number of years before we get there. But I hope the ruling will push us in that direction. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, we're always <laughs> trying to uh, fight over the scraps we get from uh, taking money from one American and uh, giving it to another American. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, there is that uh, potential problem of um, <clears throat> getting schools uh, that would normally be not dependent upon the public sector, yes. private schools in this situation, um, <clears throat> dependent on the public 
largesse. So like Leon, I would prefer that um, the, uh, you know, the, the government would be out of the education system to a certain extent. And um, so I don't know, I guess maybe I, I don't, not 100% agreement, only from lack of serious thought and study on, on the subject. But I, I went to a Catholic school. My elementary school is Catholic. And first two years of high school. So, you know, I, I know what sacrifices families have to make in order to both pay taxes to send your child to a public school and uh, save the, the money aside to send their child to a private school in addition to, the, to that, to the other. So... Um, yeah, I get it. Whereas vouchers would be, okay, we're getting the taxes and now I can send it one way or another. But uh, it's still getting money from one American to send your kid to school. And you're the other American or the kid is, but I don't know. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good subject. And you know, I suppose we could sit and talk with Leon for a couple of hours over it, and he would <laughs> be able to convince us or or at least educate us one way or another about it. Well, maybe, maybe we should leave that for another show because I'll be glad. Uh, that's another topic. That's one of my pet peeves, you know, <laughs> <laughs> condition in public schools. <laughs> All right, so. Yeah, we like you. We like your pet pet peeves because uh, you go. You always get the last word in. On that. Well, <laughs> we we've kind of lost Leon to a laughing fit, so let me jump in. <laughs> and uh, um, so, like, you know, there, there are a few issues though around schools. I mean, we we have a, a couple of you know serious issues for libertarians around schools. One is the fact that government has, has given itself essentially a monopoly with the public school. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. uh, you know, so there's a lack of competition Leon was talking about. But then there's another issue that, you know, Tim raised as well, which is you're, from a libertarian perspective, you're taking money from one person to use for another. So there's a redistribution going on, too, which, you know, for the more hardcore libertarians, that's a problem with as well. Um, and I think the, the more the compromise position is sort of the Milton Friedman vouchers position where it's, it's sort of like, okay, if we acknowledge that we are going to have this transfer to at least help kids to the starting line, I guess, and, and then at least we can get the competition in that way, you know, uh, by letting them at least choose which schools they're going to instead of, you know, uh, well, your zip code is uh, essentially condemned you <laughs> <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever public option you have. Condemn is a correct word. Seriously. Yeah. Well, right you know, the, the Hoover Institute had a great, I, I think I mentioned this once in the past, but they had a great analogy on this a little cartoon video. But, you know, imagine that, you know, we got our food the same way we did our public ed, you know. And I mean, you know, if, if you had to go to a government cafeteria based on your zip code, <laughs> that was your only choice for, for food. You know? and, and if you wanted to go to another one, yeah, you could, but you got to get permission. And only if there's spaces available, can you change cafeterias? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I think most of us could see how ridiculous that was, you know, and all the benefits we get from competition in the food industry and all these different ch choices and, you know, prices, like all the compromises that you could possibly get, you know, and trade-offs for food. But instead, you know, we, we, you know, with public ed, it's just, you know, hey, it's it's so important that only government can do it and it doesn't seem to be, you know, having a raging success at the moment. True, so. true, very true, mm. very true. <clears throat> yeah, especially today with uh, the internet and the uh, options out there for uh, teaching your own child uh there's um there's just now i th i think more and more options away from public ed and they're still sucking that money usually through property tax uh out to um to funnel into um into it into public yeah. ed so that brings up another funny point too and it uh, with the lockdowns as well and that's that recently schools public schools have locked down in a lot of places uh, around the country saying they're not even going to be in for the fall semester and my my kids are, are actually getting hit by that as well 
Yeah. And and the idea that well you know there's there's your lack of choice again you know <laughs> you're just yeah. you know locked in and whatever they that they say I, you know my daughter she wound up finishing I I felt you know fairly strong because she was uh, doing putting an extra work into a lot of projects she was getting this last time when they shut down but uh, I felt like for my son it was literally a couple half hours he was being contacted in Zoom meetings a week and. I just saw, you know, my gosh, I don't, I don't think the kids are getting anything out of this, you know, for the, exactly. the younger that they are. So it's a tragedy. And of course, everybody's still getting paid. <laughs> of course, of course. But you no know, there's, there's, good, there's, good research, there's good research that shows that those kids who do not get this in-person instruction, I mean, they, they could be damaged, I mean, psychologically. And seriously, there's, there's research on this, and they were talking about it just the other day uh, uh, on the news. So I don't know. I this this whole lockdown and not kids not going back to school and that kind of stuff. But the kids is the least is 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 the least vulnerable in this COVID pandemic. And I don't know what is the reason for them to stay home. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we'll take we'll take precautions. I I would grant you that we'll take the necessary precautions. But but why do they stay home? Why? What is what 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 is the science behind that? Yeah. It's uh, just an edict, man. It's a political edict. I I you know I thought we were. We keep being told we're in a democracy and how important our votes are. And here we just have leaders just telling us the way it's going to be. And tell me about it. Yes. <laughs> tell, well, they, they, they're telling us. They're telling us what is essential and what is not. Imagine that. Well, Leon, I don't want to risk aborting your your. <laughs> you know, your, 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 <laughs> the topic that's been driving you crazy for for weeks. But we're, I want to get us to the promised land. So we're going to be here. Uh, we want to give you another Supreme Court uh, uh, decision that was uh, fairly uh, instrumental recently, and that's that uh, in Louisiana, uh, the Supreme Court has said that uh, it, it struck down a Louisiana law that I believe said you had to have admitting privileges in order to provide abortions. And um, what was interesting about this case is that the deciding vote was Justice Chief Justice Roberts. And, <laughs> He had apparently a few years earlier he had voted opposite uh, uh, yes. with minority in defending. I, I think I believe it was a Texas law. A Texas that, law, yes. It yeah, was it was going to require these admitting, admitting, uh, admitting privileges. But now he has switched for some reason. Uh, I think because he wants to have balance on the court or something. I'm not quite sure. I think he cited starry decisis and said that you know, well, because we've decided this way in the past, it's got to always be that way. I, you know, sounds a little like a cop out, but anyways, uh, regarding uh, this, he uh, essentially the decision has made it uh, uh, them have to throw out that law, and it, it makes it easier to get abortions in Louisiana. So, regardless of how you feel about the specific abortion issue, uh, that is the nuts and bolts of what happened there. And you guys have anything to uh, add on that? You know, John Roberts. John Roberts is another one. See, he, he, like he's losing his legal mind. Okay, you are supposed to be this great promise of, of, of a man who believed in in, in, the, in the text of the law and all these sort of things. Now look at uh, look at what he's saying. He's saying that well, Starry decides us, meaning that, well, it has been decided, it is precedent, so we, he could switch sides and that would be no problem. We have to go by what the courts have said in the past. Well, the courts also said that black people were, were, were okay with being slaves, so we were supposed to stick with that too. That's his logic. That's the nonsense of this man. Anyway, yeah. I'm getting all worked up here. Yeah, I'm getting worked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that um, that whole concept of uh, precedent and and sticking with it is uh, has been uh, done too much by the Supreme Court, and that they ought to uh, look at things. Uh, you know, and, and again, you know, you you got to make a case for it based on the Constitution, how it was written at the time it was written. Yes. And, you know, you you want to still, uh, in my opinion, I mean, and there's people that don't think you have to do that even, but, uh, you know, it, uh, original, uh, what's it called? Original intent. Original intent. Original yeah. intent. Yes. Yeah, original intent. But, um, and yeah, I believe in that. I believe that you should utilize that in, in analyzing whether something is, uh, is correct or not. A, a law is constitutional or not. And uh, to uh, to just um, not be able to change your mind, maybe you maybe you looked at it in a different way, and and you know what, thought you were wrong the first time, and now you, or the court was wrong, 
the right. court was wrong right. at some previous time <clears throat> for whatever reason, and you're going to make a new case for it. And you know how often have we all changed our minds on on things? And and you know maybe we some of us change our minds a little too often. <laughs> flip, something about flipping and flopping. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly think there's times and places that you can and situations where you can change your mind. And, and sure. this may be one where you shouldn't change your mind from the first time, too. You know, I don't know. But, yeah, um, so now now people have an easier time getting an, an abortion. What was the, the crux of the reason again? Um, they, it, well, what made it easier? Uh, what the issue is, is that the law was going to require admitting privileges. So if you were uh, had an abortion clinic, you'd have to have the privileges to be able to bring your patient to the hospital, I guess, yes. and work on them there. So, and I, you know, you can oh. kind of see how there's maybe a logic to that. And, and, you know, you can also see how maybe that's, you know, maybe that that's a way where they're trying to as well make some restrictions, but either way, um, you know, it's it's something where it's uh, it's front and center in this abortion debate right now, and so uh, it's a good. But that, that does bring up a more important point, I guess, uh, for us to get into, and that's uh, abortion and what libertarians think about abortion as well. That's that's actually one of those issues that really divides a lot of uh, uh, libertarians. So um, you know, you guys have some thoughts on that, you know, and want to jump into that. Well, I'm going to let Leon have the last word, so I'm going to just launch. Um, so the way I look at it, we have uh, two schools of thought. One would be that right up front, the baby is uh, a human being uh, from the, the moment of conception. Baby is a human being and is uh, therefore protected themselves. They have their own private property rights and their, their own li right to life, liberty, uh, and eventually uh, pro well, not liberty necessarily, but life at least. And eventually, uh, when they're born, then they can go ahead and, I mean, even a, a newborn baby is pretty darn dependent, let's face it, you know. They, they without the mother and, you know, the family supporting the baby, uh, they would die, you know, just like a, a baby in the womb is dependent upon the mother. Now, the other, so there's that that one aspect. The other one is the baby's a trespasser and uh, the baby does not, uh, is trespassing on my private property rights to my own body. And so therefore I have a right to kick the trespasser out uh, and, and I have a right, uh, sovereign right to my body, which, you know, no doubt you have a right to your body. So my response to the trespasser thing is you invited the trespasser in there because you had sex with the father. And without that, there would be no trespasser. So in my, unless you were raped, which is a different situation, but uh, in the world of abortion, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare situation where that comes up. But uh, outside of rape, you invited the trespasser in. And so in my opinion, you, uh, because you invited them in now, have a responsibility to, uh, to that child. And, you know, because with rights also come responsibilities. And so, yes, you have a right to your body. Yes, you have a right to invite a trespasser in and have sex with whoever, you know, you, you feel like you want to have sex with. And so, therefore, um, if you're reproductive organs are healthy enough to have a child come about it, then now all of a sudden you've got responsibility to, to that child. So that's how I look at it morally where, okay. So those are the two different sides. And I, I come, you can kind of see where I'm going on this, at least morally, but the other situation comes up with what do we do now that we know people are going to do it, whether we make it legal or not. So if they, uh, well, people are going to kill people too. They're going to murder people. Exactly. We make it legal or not. I'm not exactly. So we have that. Yeah. So I guess, you know, you have to decide whether you are going to go all in on protecting lives of people born or unborn, there's still people, 
And there are people at the moment of conception, this nonsense about, you know, a, a bunch of tissue and all that. I mean, <clears throat> once those two, once the sperm and the egg go in there and they start splitting and splitting again and splitting again, all the chromosomal uh, 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 things are there for hair color, eye color. Are you going to be good at basketball? How good are you at learning a new language? All that stuff is in there. And how hot, tall are you going to be? It's all there from the moment of conception in a DNA chains that pass between cell from one cell to the next. Uh, and from the moment of conception, that person is a hundred percent that person. And if you leave it alone, it's just going to go pop out in nine months. And there you have it. So, so, uh, and it's a human, it's not a dog, a cat, a horse or cow. It's nothing but human. So let's just, all that other talk is just an excuse for uh, doing what you want to do, which is, I don't want this kid and I can't just give it up for adoption. And so, okay, I guess I'm going to have to abort the kid. You know, that's well, hey, Tim, 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 let me break in real quick. We got yeah. Leon to the promised land and I want to make sure right. Leon Let gets Leon to talk go. <laughs> Let Leon go. I'm sorry. How much time we got? I'm listening to Tim. I mean, I, I don't have a problem, honestly. No, but anyway, let, 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 we, we can talk, okay? I mean, full disclaimer, I was raised Catholic. I have, this have nothing to do with me that, with that fact, okay? I just want to be clear about that. Just like you said, at the moment of conception, this thing, whatever you want to call it, has all the DNA profile of a human being. It may not be fully developed, but it has a DNA profile. And that should be enough for all of us because we are not God. Maybe you don't believe in God, but that's fine. But we are not God. That should be enough. We supposed to believe in, in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's something at the core of our beliefs as libertarians. And we should hold to that belief. If we hold to that belief, I do not understand. I do not understand why only at the moment of exit of the womb that we have decided that that is when that thing, which has now become a, a person, I suppose, can is deserving of our full protection. I, this I could not, I could never understand. And besides, that is a very arbitrary point when you really think about it, because they are premature babies. They could come out of the womb as early as maybe four and a half months. Oh, sure, they have to go into intensive care and all that, but they do survive. So we know the exit of the womb is not the correct point for you to claim that this is the, full, the time that they, be, they truly become a full person deserving of our protection. We, as libertarians, believe in non-aggression. Well, most of us believe in non-aggression. How could we then support the ultimate aggression against the most vulnerable among us, which is the unborn? We believe in property rights. It's very sacred to us. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. What is more precious than the property rights of our bodies? What could be more precious than that? We believe in the sovereignty and the dominion of our own bodies. And here we are debating and we are uncertain as to whether the unborn is deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, when you go to one of these abortion rallies, you always see a sign that says, my body, my choice. It is one of the biggest lies that they tell us because it's not her body. No, it is true. It is housed within her body. It is true. It is connected to her body. I am not denying any of that, but it's not her body. We could prove that scientifically. And if it is not her body, then she has no right to have the, the right to kill it. Absolutely none because that is a person. It may not be a fully developed person, but it is a person fully deserving of our protections. And I do not understand why we libertarians cannot understand that this is aggression, the ultimate aggression against the unborn, the ultimate of all aggression against the unborn. There's no right in this world that should give anyone the right to take the right, to take the life of another person. And that is what we are doing when we allow abortion. So that's my first shot. Let's go.
<laughs> well, yeah, I, I'd, I'd want to add just a little bit to it, but uh, we're running up on Knucklehead Noise Patrol. But if oh, you yeah. guys want to stick around for a bonus afterwards, I'll, I'll at least try and give a tiny rebuttal to your magnificent uh, oratory. <laughs> I've been anyway. waiting too long, Jason. I've been waiting too long. <laughs> Here we come. Uh, it's, it's now time for our Knucklehead Noise Patrol. And uh, there we go. That's the sound. <laughs> so in this, uh, you know, we like to try and end the normal show on a uh, on on a something where we're looking at something odd or weird that's come out in the public. You know, somebody said something or did something that's just kind of beyond the pale. And you know, hopefully that leaves us on a on a good laugh at the end of the show. Uh, well, uh, recently, uh, President Trump. Uh, was, uh, you know, he's tweeting all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's funny in this particular one, I'm, it's not so much the message that I'm necessarily condemning, but it's just the tweet, which is, I guess, what everybody's tweeting, uh, you know, upset about him with a lot of times. But, anyways, uh, so he tweeted and he invoked a game show host for his position on, uh, he, I guess, he, he was trying to say for his position on, on COVID. And so essentially he invoked Chuck Woolery, uh, who used to be the game show host on uh, Love Connection and yeah. I think the Wheel of Fortune, I think. Uh, and, and nothing wrong with Chuck Woolery, it's just his opinion, but it's just odd that Trump tweeted him. And he said this, uh, essentially Woolery's uh, uh, tweet was the CDC media, Democrats, our doctors, not all but most uh, that we are told to trust. I think it's about uh, the election and keeping the economy uh, from coming back, uh, which is about the election. I'm sick of it, his tweet said. Uh, so uh, I guess it was uh, something that uh, was about, um, you know, uh, maybe lacking trust in those. And so Trump retweeted him, which is, uh, you know, to me, the, the issue is, why is our president of all people retweeting game show? Hosts? I mean, he <laughs> would just think there's there's so many sources, and he can he, he can use his own credibility as the president, but yeah. he's he's using the opportunity to bring game show host to speak for him and i it's it's kind of weird anyways i don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that <laughs> wow. the tweeter in chief <laughs> the tweeter in chief uh, should uh spend more time reading books instead of tweeting i think but he apparently has no interest in learning new things uh, or new concepts uh so I don't know, other than what game show hosts have to say about things. Um, but yeah, Leon, you know, what do you think? No, I, I mean, I, I mean, the, the tweet itself, the tweet itself is, is a valid point. But why Trump had to be spending his time, you're right, retweeting yeah. a game show host? I mean, come on, it's kind of it's kind of ridiculous. Come on, he's a commander in chief. I'm sure you have you have better things to do, right? I mean, yeah, I'm sure but, there's all these political things are associated with with the lockdown and all that. But come on, geez, come on, man. I mean, spending time is a little bit better. People say he spends a lot of time tweeting, and uh, and uh, I wonder, is that really him, or is there some, some like a, a huge contingent, like ten or twelve people, and that's all they do all day long? Is they're paid to tweet uh, in his stead? I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard well, to the, tell. Wh what I understand is that um, some of the tweets are his. But uh, others are written by some of his staff. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd, I'd almost wish they'd give him a waiting period for his tweets so he could have a chance to just think about it for 20, <laughs> 20 minutes or so. <laughs> but anyway, speaking of time, we are running out of time pretty fast here. Okay. And so I wanted to uh, uh, thank you all for tuning into the Libertarian uh, Counterpoint. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, comments. Oh, oh, looks like uh, we do have a comment. So uh, we will go to a bonus section where we will look at both the comment and uh, uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit more about abortion uh, from the libertarian perspective. But I did want to uh, let you know that if, if you uh, like our show, you can come and see us more on Libertarian Counterpoint on Facebook and uh, there's uh, YouTube as well. Uh, so thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you.